yeah, Ron and, and his partner, and they, they, you know, they've adopted, I think, well to Bitcoin while still being bullish on gold. And they kind of use those as diversification and risk management. And so that, that's kind of how I would approach that if I was, uh, you know, from say from a gold investor standpoint. If you had to bet your entire net worth as to what will still exist in 100 years, gold or Bitcoin, what would you say? Well, I think at this stage, I mean, gold is the one you know won't go to zero, right? Yeah. So there, I can imagine tail risks for Bitcoin. Um, I think, for example, that Bitcoin will probably be higher than gold. You know, it'll, it'll have it'll have returned more value, more purchasing power than gold over the next 10, 20 years. The further you look out, though, you know, there's obviously risk. We're talking about a 13 year old asset compared to, you know, a 5000 year old asset or, you know, really an right. asset that's as old as the sun. Um, and so, uh, you know, those are two different things. I would also say, you know, the, a key risk I would have with gold is that we are seeing that there is this increased interest, especially among younger investors, into say Bitcoin and other assets, and so I'd be I'd be somewhat concerned about holding gold on its own for that sense. Uh, I basically mm -hmm. think a, a gold plus Bitcoin allocation is actually in some ways safer than just gold, and I know the guys over at uh, Incrementum, you know, they I think they have that that fund that's like say mostly gold, and then it has a slice of Bitcoin in it. They mm -hmm. they kind of you know they they they're the ones that publish the In Gold We Trust report. Yeah, Ronnie. Um, yeah, Ronnie and 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 his partner, and they they you know they've adopted I think well to Bitcoin while still being bullish on gold, and they kind of use those as diversification and risk management, and so that, that's kind of how I would approach that if I was, uh, you know, from say from a gold investor standpoint, and I think also you can say okay, you know, my approach anyway is that I want to be exposed to multiple things that I consider finite. So when I you know I often talk about commodity exposure. And gold is on its own beat compared to many other, you know, say industrial commodities. They don't necessarily go up and down at the same time. Mm. And also you can have specific issues of one commodity that might suppress it. So gold, silver, copper, energy, Bitcoin. Um, I like to kind of spread my bets around a little bit in terms of things that I expect to hold on to their value for, you know, say a 10 year period. Yeah, I think what Ronnie's doing is really smart. Uh, that, that seems to be a very prudent approach. I, I've never understood why people would want to choose gold or Bitcoin. And, and, and not choose both to a certain degree based on what your objectives were and your age and your income and whatnot. Uh, that, that always seems to make the most sense. And I think especially in today's world, uh, you know, like we were saying earlier, the price of Bitcoin is, is in my opinion, the least interesting thing uh, just because you know, this push towards authoritarianism. And uh, who knows if you might need to have some sort of purchasing power that's outside of the banking system moving forward. And even if Bitcoin... You know, goes down in price by 20 or 30 percent who cares uh at that point in time you'd be very glad that you had that uh asset or that purchasing power that was outside of the commercial banks there are even interesting technologies that are building on bitcoin in terms of sending data and so the impervious ai is kind of considered like a third layer on top of bitcoin it runs on top of the lightning network and so now you can do say uh you know peer-to-peer -peer messaging uh mm. you know phone calls over over lightning uh, and basically, they're using the Satoshi's going on the on the Lightning, and you basically have a virtual VPN, like a VPN over over Lightning, and mm. so it's kind of a, an extra layer of security. And so there are, uh, you know, the broader term in the crypto space would be Web 3.0, right? The idea right. That, that basically there's a more decentralized things. You know, some of the some of the challenges there is that some of those underlying protocols themselves are somewhat centralized, uh, mm. and so they can still be disabled. They have attack services that the state go after them, uh, and so. Based on Bitcoin, you see maybe less proliferation, but the ones that are being built, I think, are a little bit more robust. Uh, and so I think there are kind of these technologies that are building. And again, that's like to your point, that's not about Bitcoin's price. That's just something that's interesting to watch. And that, you know, I believe that they're coming out with a browser as well. And, and so you mm. see over time, I think we're going to have more technologies that, that you know, try to go around the existing kind of centralized forces that, that make up say the internet and the financial system and you see them kind of moving around towards the edges and towards this more open source distributed type of situation situation before we continue help us clicking that youtube like button and subscribe now to our channel this shows the algorithm that you valued this information and it helps us spread that message sharing is caring and now let's continue Okay, so let's go from something that's rather complex to something that's uh, a little easier to understand, and that would be energy, uh, just kind of more supply and demand there. I think, I mean, what I've been paying attention to is really China and Evergrande with their real estate market crashing. And I, I listened to my good buddy, uh, Jason Burke, his interview with Kyle Bass, which was fascinating. I think that came out yesterday. And uh, Kyle was describing what, what he 
kind of how he saw China playing out in the future. Uh, but such a large component of their GDP is real estate. And if Xi Jinping allows that to continue to decline, uh, to kind of have this soft landing and deflate that bubble, uh, I see that as uh, you know, being very negative, possibly in the short term, uh, for commodities such as iron ore. So h- how do you see that? Yeah, so I agree. I'm not particularly bullish on iron ore uh, itself. Um, as for energy, I, I've kind of I've separated the time frames, uh, and so you know I, I I tweeted a few weeks ago, or it might have been a month ago now, where I was talking about how like uh, you know it, would it be funny to see like say Chinese tech tech stocks start to do well and oil stocks start to struggle because everyone was so super bearish on China and so super bullish on energy. The sentiment, of course, can get out of whack for periods of time, mm. uh, and so say with with energy stocks, it's one of those things where if you if you zoom in. They, they looked like overbought to some extent. Uh, everyone's kind of talking constantly about the energy crisis in Europe and then also the you know in, in, in China with coal. And so, you know, that I think could be overdone for periods of time. So I wouldn't be surprised uh, if energy markets just don't do very well over six months or even a year. Uh, my, my kind of viewpoint is longer term and saying, okay, five, 10 years out. I, I think that essentially the 2020s are going to be a, a pretty good decade for energy prices and energy producers. Uh, and it's essentially a supply demand issue uh, and that there are because, you know, everything's kind of priced around the margin when there are fluctuations in demand, whether it's Chinese housing or maybe some sort of deflationary shock related to debt in 2022. Uh, you know, there are these periods of time where I think it will underperform, but that, you know, you're, st- you're starting from such a small base. And so, for example, the energy sector uh, reaches all time low weighting in the S&P 500 uh, last year. It got down mm-hmm. to like 2%. Uh, and right. it's since rebounded all the way up to like, you know, like 3%. Uh, and so it seems like it's overbought and, you know, in the near term it might be, but it's still one of the lowest weight re- weightings that it ever was. Um, while also the the supply and the demand, I think, characteristics, especially on the supply side, are, are more favorable for it going forward. How did energy in the commodity space uh, behave in the 1940s? Uh, it did very well. Um so a general rule of thumb within, with say the inflationary decades and commodity prices is that all the inflationary decades had high like high commodity inflation as well. It, it's been kind of an axiom that it's hard to get inflation without high commodity prices. Uh, that there have been some periods where we have high commodity prices without without necessarily super high official CPI. So you can kind of have the other way around, but all the inflationary periods do come with these higher commodity prices. And essentially, because what you get is an increase in the money supply and then some sort of natural resource constraint. And so you can imagine a hypothetical economy that was entirely consisting of software, right? And so if everybody got more money all of a sudden, that might not necessarily translate into higher prices because the cost of producing those goods doesn't really change. The, the marginal cost of selling an additional uh, subscription to a, a, a software- Yeah, your margins are 100% anything. on that. All your costs are fixed. Exactly. So it basically, people might buy more software, but it might not actually affect the prices of that software, or at least not much. Whereas if you have a, a, an economy that's really based on labor and commodities, uh, you know, it's really about that resource constraint. And so, the, you know, things can fluctuate from periods of time to see what's what's tight and what's not. But essentially, uh, especially historically, and I still think that even though we've, we've become somewhat more digital, uh, you know, we're still very reliant on that physical connection to the world, these physical resources, especially in developing markets where they're, they have much lower per capita usage of them. Uh, and so as, as they generally grow over time, uh, even to get up to a, a, a fraction of what of what we use in the in say Europe and the United States, you know North America, uh, I still think there's a, a runway of growth ahead there. While many of their supplies are are rather constrained. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over three thousand percent in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system, makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn five hundred thousand, one million dollar. You have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.